Okay, with that, welcome everybody. Hey, this is Mike Shirobi, and uh, welcome to our, our Cyber Thought Leadership sponsored by BitSight and CyberBuyer today. So with everything kind of going on, uh, I know there's been a lot of words around, around the pandemic and everything. Um, been fortunate, uh, been uh, doing some podcasting with, with Joe Topinka uh, since uh, he had his retirement earlier this year in February. I don't know what kind of crystal ball he has over there, but pretty good timing that uh, Joe uh, hit, hit the retirement button right before this COVID thing hit. But uh, with that, Joe's been uh, pretty engaged on a lot of different client engagements, uh, being a consultant. So um, really kind of the purpose of today's meeting is really just to talk about some of the, the thought leadership that uh, Joe has. Um, Joe's been um, CIO of the year a couple of times, three times been recognized both in uh, uh, Minnesota and uh, here in Charlotte. Um, he's certainly a thought leader amongst CIOs. And for some of those that may or may not know, uh, Joe has also have done, has done a lot in cyber and has seen the maturity and has had some, some recent experiences on some of the things that that he wants to uh, shed some light on, on how that goes. Um, but before we, we pass the mic over to, to Joe, we'd like to introduce our friends at BitSight. So with that, uh, I'll pass the mic over to Karen. Karen, um, would you like to say, say some things about, about yourself and BitSight? Yeah, I'd love to. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, Joe. Uh, hey, everyone. My name is Karen Wilson. I am over at BitSight, and uh, I work primarily in the Carolinas. Uh, for those of you who haven't heard about BitSight, what we do is cybersecurity ratings. So you can think of it like a personal credit score, right? The, uh, the lower the score, the higher the risk. The higher the rating, the lower the risk. Uh, businesses use us in two primary ways. They use us to shore up their supply chain, whether that's when they onboard their third parties um, and then continuously monitor those third and fourth parties for risk. In the same frame, they'll flip that lens around on themselves and use it to monitor their own security posture from an external point of view, uh, whether that's giving you an enterprise level view. If you've got subsidiaries, uh, you can use it for mergers and acquisitions to see what kind of risk you might be taking on your network um, and all sorts of fun things that I'm sure we'll dive into a little bit more here. Excellent. Thank you, Karen. We really appreciate uh, having your support and, and sponsoring part of uh, Cyber Buyer. And for those who aren't familiar with, with Cyber Buyer, uh, this is Mike Shrubby. Um, part of uh, the IT community here in Charlotte I've been part of is uh, predominantly, predominantly folks that know me has been Valentine IT. And uh, about two, two and a half years ago, three years ago, uh, Mike Brandon, one of our CIO members, uh, mentioned that, hey, look, there's a, there's a lot of traction going on in regards to the cybersecurity folks that are here in town and would love to support a breakfast. Um, our CIO groups, uh, we're meeting uh, for breakfast once a month. And then uh, Mike and uh, also Mike Hillhouse kind of had the vision of, hey, there's, a, there, there's, there's some folks that want to get together and talk about cyber here in town. So over the last kind of two years, I've been kind of a fly on the wall and kind of seeing what's going on. Uh, my, my business uh, as a technology broker, a cloud broker, um, really just kind of sat on the sidelines. There's, you know, some, some products and services that we, we have worked with clients in the past, but really over the last two to three years, what I've seen is this, this space has really got, gotten deep and wide pretty fast. So uh, we're launching a separate business called Cyber Buyer, where uh, we have access to, you know, approximately about 100 different cybersecurity vendors. And uh, we, we vetted those out over the last couple of years. And, you know, cyber is going through kind of a refresh here. And uh, we coincidentally ran into our friends here at BitSight. And you know, it was a pleasant surprise in regards to cyber. Nobody's really kind of raising their hand, sharing what type of uh, vendors they're using. But wow, um, pleasantly surprised and getting introduced to BitSight and what they're doing for clients. So um, really kind of neat tip of the spear type of things. But uh, again, very, very thankful to have our friends at BitSight uh, join us today. Um, with that, we also have Matthew Gunnels on, on the call. Matthew, with BitSight, is there anything else that you'd like to say before we, we turn it over to Joe here? Happy Tuesday, everybody. Uh, thanks, for, thanks for joining us. Um, like Kieran, I'm based out of Raleigh, so uh, local to the area. I'm the channel manager, though, so basically I work with our partners, like Mike, and uh, help and enable them and um, you know, do things like this. So uh, the one thing I'll say is if they're, you know, as the world comes back alive, if you guys have any recommendations, I know everybody's drowning in, in virtual content right now. So if you guys have any recommendations of 
ways that we can get back out there, things that you would like to do, uh, definitely shoot them, shoot them to Mike and, and we'll, we'll do our best to put, put together the uh, events that everybody likes. So uh, thanks for having me, Mike, and, and, and letting us be a part of it. Absolutely. Thank you, Matthew. Thank you guys for your support. So with that, a couple of things that Joe's going to kick off and talk about today is really kind of two parts. Uh, one is from the, the, the IT leader, the technology leader, um, you know, massive, this massive pandemic, you know, with all the cloud and the impact and the new cyber risks to CIOs and CISOs from, from that, that pane of glass. And the second part is a kind of the C-suite. Joe's been in on um, you know, some venture capital, but he's also been in the C-suite and really kind of me as an outsider, one of the one of the challenges is really that that, that C-suite talk, right? How do what are, what are they thinking about? How do they talk? It's a little bit different language than than us folks that are in in on the IT side of the house. So J Joe's really going to talk about, hey, how is the C-suite kind of you know? There's a lot of folks going all in on digital transformation, and it kind of creates some unknown risks that we know, right? And and how are those battles actually? Recent had a, a had a client a few months ago that uh, was doing a call center project. And before the, the, the C-suite did not want to do anything cloud, and then all of a sudden pandemic hit and they're like, wow, now we have attention, we have budget. So uh, maybe some of you folks are, are going through some of that, but uh, that certainly changes <laughs> how things go with budget and, and getting things done. So uh, with that, um, for those that you don't, don't know Joe, uh, we talked a little bit briefly. Um, he's, he's recently retired but um, he's been doing a lot of consulting. What Joe's really known for is his CIO mentor business. He's been uh, helping mentoring uh, CIOs. Um, he's also um, in the IT communities and a lot of different, a lot of different groups. Um, and then he's most, most known for, if you see over here on my right shoulder, I've got his book on my, my shelf. We got a signed copy. Uh, so thank you, Joe. Uh, is IT business partnerships. And uh, he's also working on a second book. But uh, with that, I will uh, kindly pass the mic over to you, Joe. And thank you for being our, our speaker today. Sounds good. Uh, well, I appreciate it, Mike. And, um, and thanks, BitSight team, for you know, sponsoring today's uh, session. And we're really excited about um, uh, the, the opportunity to share some insights with you today. Um, so with that, I will um, jump right in since we're a little bit behind schedule. Uh, and. Uh, let me know if you can see my slides there. Looks good. All right, great. Um, so thanks for that nice introduction, Mike. Um, yeah, I'm very active been in the IT community in one form or another for more than 40 years. Um, I'm active here in Charlotte, I'm president of Charlotte Area Technology Collaborative. It's a not-for-profit that is trying to, you know, build a technology pipeline, the talent pipeline, starting with elementary school students. I'm also very active with the Business Relationship Management Institute. I'm act chair, uh, board chair of the Institute. That's a 30,000 member worldwide organization focused on that dis discipline. Um, and then I, I'm also, you know, lucky enough to collaborate with Mike uh, with Valentine IT. I'm wearing my Valentine IT uh, golf shirt today in, in, in honor of uh, today's meeting. And so I'm excited to be here. Um, as Mike said, uh, we've broken the presentation into a couple of different components. Um, and I, I'm going to just kind of quickly run through some ideas and concepts and see uh, if they resonate with all of you. And, and if you have questions along the way, uh, we can certainly make this interactive. Uh, but, uh, you know, I think, as everyone knows, the pandemic has been um, incredibly challenging for many different fronts. Um, a lot of companies who were resistant, as Mike said, to the cloud have all of a sudden found their way moving to the cloud or desperate to get there. Um, and certainly there have been a lot of implications to that from a cybersecurity standpoint. Um, and I, I would say that, you know, the complexity around risk and cyber has, has continued to escalate over the years. And uh, it certainly was true before the pandemic, you know, with uh, disruptive technologies, uh, IoT-based devices and machine learning and, I, and cloud uh, advancements, all of those sort, sort of things were combining to, to really change the risk landscape. Uh, we've certainly seen our share of geopolitical events across the globe. Um, certainly the elections have escalated risk in cyber. You, you can't uh, pick up any newspaper. Well, nobody picks them up. They read them on their phones. But you, you, you can certainly read about all of the craziness that's going on in the world. Um, there's a great book by Teresa Payton called Manipulated that she wrote about the 2016 elections, which came out a couple of weeks ago. Read that um, before the election and you'll find 
how many people have been swayed by um, fake, real fake news, which sounds kind of crazy with real fake news. Um, and then of course the UK's exit from the um, European Union has created uh, complexities that are starting to show up now in the world. And then in the middle of all of that, um, the COVID-19 crisis. Um, and so risk and risk culture has been under pressure on, at enterprises uh, and companies around the globe. And, in, and nothing could be more true than today. And I'll give you some statistics to kind of highlight that for you. Um, since the pandemic arrived, uh, here in the US, um, nearly 50% of workers are now uh, working from home. Um, and in some industries and in some companies that I'm working with, it's closer to 90%. Uh, my prior, uh, in my prior role, clearly you've got, um, they're a distribution company with 30 different um, uh, distribution centers around the, the U.S. Those distribution centers, um, you know, can't operate without people in them. So they've, they had to take precautions, uh, just like manufacturers here. We, Mike and I both know a number of different manufacturing organizations, and uh, they've had to take, um, you know, unique precautions to keep employees safe, et cetera. So, a massive movement to, to work from home. I used to have a boss um, that would uh, walk the, the aisles on Fridays around four to see who was around. Um, those sorts of things don't happen anymore. Maybe they're, they're scrolling virtually to see who's, whose little green ball is, is, is green or red or, or, or yellow or away. But definitely a, a major influence on cyber. Um, this is a report from the FBI. They said that they saw an increase of 800% uh, cyber crimes reported um, since the pandemic arrived. This is a, a mid-summer stat. I think it's closer to a thousand percent now and with the, the elections upon us, I think uh, that number is going to climb even more. The same thing is true of banks. They're saying 230 percent increase in cyber reported crimes. Uh, phenomenal numbers when you step back and think about it. Uh, and, you know, businesses, when they were surveyed, uh, by the Wall Street Journal, um, more than half expected that they'd have a breach or a cyber incident related to some sort of remote working experience. So massive numbers. Uh, and this last statistic here um, uh, came from uh, the same, same research paper, but cybersecurity professionals say only 41% of the time, meaning almost 60% of the time, uh, they don't feel they've got the best platforms to secure remote workers. So those are some of the, the headlines around, you know, kind of what we're dealing with from a risk and cybersecurity standpoint. Um, and interestingly enough, uh, people who are newly working from home, uh, are 53% are using their own computers uh, to do work um, or their cell own cell phone. So that's, that's a pretty big number. And almost, you know, 45, 50% are saying that they're not being provided any new insights or training. So that's become a real challenge is people are working from home. If you if if you have a spouse and you have kids, everyone's online. Everyone's pulling bandwidth. Um, my prior company um, manufactures uh, home entertainment equipment, including router switches, access points out to our TVs, things of that nature. Interestingly enough, their business is up 20% over last year. But that's pre-COVID numbers. So. Uh, people are home, they're working, it's putting a lot of pressure on home networks, um, cybersecurity training is, is becoming um, more prevalent now. Uh, I've seen some companies actually take their corporate cybersecurity training and make it available to, to families as well. So that's an interesting statistic. Um, they actually interviewed and surveyed um, people who work with PII, that's personal, personally identifiable information. Um, and surprisingly, a bunch of them uh, are using their own uh, personal computers uh, instead of uh, corporate sponsored computers. Many of them are posting pictures of their work environment from home while they're working with PII, kind of crazy. Um, and many of them, you see 37% are reusing passwords uh, for business applications and personal accounts as well. Um, and over 50% say that their companies have not um, provided any new policies or training around PII. So just some staggering numbers to think about as we're dealing with the pandemic. What I'd like to do is shift gears a little bit and talk about eight major trends that I think are influencing risk and cybersecurity in, in organizations. And we'll talk about digital transformation in a moment. But the first of which is um, a brand new Department of Defense standard called Cybersecurity Maturity Certification. It's a new process that launched in, in uh, January, they started working on this 
over a year ago, um, and uh, programs are now um, starting to, or RFPs are starting to show up uh, where companies are beginning to adopt this new standard. And I'm gonna talk more about what that standard looks like and give you some specifics on why you should pay attention to it. Um, it's uh, made some huge improvements over the traditional NIST framework that many of us are familiar with. So that's a new standard and, and what we're seeing is uh, many, many companies are starting to adopt the CMMC philosophies and standards and practices because it, it shores up some gaps in the NIST framework. So that's one major trend. A second major trend centers around, not surprisingly, machine learning and artificial intelligence. And we're starting to see some incredibly sophisticated solutions show up that are now available to cybersecurity professionals. Things like cybersecurity report cards like BitSight. Um, I happened to be um, a customer of BitSight when I was at Snap AV. Um, phenomenal platform and really was instrumental in helping us get our arms around our public IP. And, uh, and it also helped us uh, with board reporting. Uh, in a way that I wasn't able to do prior to, to getting the, the tool. And I've got a, 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 a snapshot of what that looks like uh, here coming up. But you're also seeing machine learning and artificial intelligence used for things like email protection uh, and endpoint protection. Um, very sophisticated tools like CrowdStrike and Mimecast and, and uh, many, many others. So pretty fascinating to see the evolution of, you know, market ready solutions that are being built around machine learning and artificial intelligence. I think that market's going to mature and as cyber security professionals, we're going to be able to benefit from that in our companies. And these tools give you the option or the ability to actually deploy state of the art next gen solutions without adding a ton of staff, in fact, no staff in most cases. So pretty interesting evolution. Um, contactless. Uh, I've, I've been working and consulting in a number of companies since uh, I retired. Um, that word retired does not really ring true for me because I've actually had a whole lot of fun and working with six or seven clients that I'm uh, consulting with uh, across the US. But contactless transactions are, are really being introduced um, and that could potentially bring new threats and vulnerabilities to the table. A lot of companies are thinking about putting contact tracing apps on their phones so they can keep track of whether or not an employee is in a building or not, or, or, or even tracking their, their medical status. I've heard some companies talk about tracking uh, people's temperatures. Obviously you get into privacy issues and cloud security issues. So that's another trend that I think we're seeing. A lot of uh, countries around the globe um, have been um, requiring um, citizens to actually install contact tracing apps on their phones. Uh, but interestingly enough, including in, um, uh, you know, communist countries, uh, they're, they're not really getting huge adoption rates, which is interesting. Um, hybrid work. Uh, this has really been an interesting challenge, and I've watched this firsthand in some companies that I'm, I'm consulting with. But when, when you've got people working in the office now at home, all of our models prior to COVID-19, the behavioral models were really geared at sort of in-office activities with a small percent of uh, work from home. So anomalous behavior, you know, trying to understand who's a real user versus who's a compromised user is a lot harder to do to deal with these days because of the, the nature of the work that we're doing. So these hybrid work models are really putting some pressure on cybersecurity professionals to understand who's, who's legitimately on the network that should be there and who's not. Um, I think uh, also IoT, huge proliferation of IoT devices across the globe, both in homes and at work. Uh, lots of sensors being deployed with software in them. I have a ton of experience in this space coming from uh, my prior life, uh, built a cloud-based IoT-based platform. Uh, and several years ago, I made a big push at that organization because we were putting onboard firmware with software embedded in them that I was concerned about. So we actually launched an initiative where we hired a third party. We used Fortalist Solutions here, a Charlotte-based company with a ton of uh, experts that are, you know, NSA, CS, CIA, um, FBI, X, X uh, technology experts that are, we gave them um, uh, our top our top 10 products and asked them to have their way with the platforms. Not all IoT manufacturers are doing those sorts of rigorous tests, but 
and when you when you put these items on your network you've got to pay attention to them and make sure that their risk profiles are understood so we're going to see more and more of that uh, exploding over the months and years to come uh, privacy is a huge concern um, i'm starting to see chief privacy officers pop up in companies especially larger enterprise companies where uh, you might have seen that nestled into the chief risk officer's responsibility, but privacy is becoming a big concern. It started in 2018 with GDPR, and then California launched their, you know, California Consumer Privacy Act, uh, which became effective this January. And we're going to start to see a lot more uh, of those state-sponsored privacy laws come into play. So I think you'll see privacy officers pop up. Um, and that's going to put more pressure on the cybersecurity teams to, to understand and know what their risks and concerns are and how policies should be shaped. One company that I consult with, that's the first words out of their mouth is, have you considered the privacy aspects of this solution? Um, so it's interesting to see the evolution of that space um, as time marches on. Cloud, you know, we've been talking about cloud in, in IT forever, but the adoption rates have certainly accelerated during COVID. Um, you know, last year Gartner came out with their secure access service edge technology framework that I see a number of companies adopting and it's putting interesting challenges and opportunities in front of cybersecurity professionals to move cybersecurity and firewalls and those sorts of things to the cloud. So we'll see lots more activity around that area as well. And then zero trust um, is something that, you know, in my past prior to the last six months in particular, that seemed more like a buzzword than a reality. Uh, but we're starting to see this happen. And I think uh, a lot of companies, uh, especially because of COVID-19, were really sensitized to their VPN infrastructure. And so we're starting to see companies adopt zero trust networks and we'll see the traditional VPNs going away and zero trust uh, network platforms take their place. So those are the, the big major trends. Um, there's some key insights that I take away when I look at uh, the landscape. Uh, I think there's three big things from a technology and cybersecurity standpoint that I think about. Uh, the first of which is learning. Uh, and, you know, when you, when you have automation and artificial intelligence and machine learning, as it evolves, the key for us will be to figure out which alerts are legitimate and which ones are not. How do you figure out what, where the noise is and where the real issues are? That's a learning that I think we're, we're, ha we're going to have to accelerate. Some of these new solutions that I've talked about, um, BitSight in particular, CrowdStrike, um, a platform that I used in my past, are all getting much, much better at not giving you false positives. But I think that's a big area that, uh, that I think as, as we mature in our cybersecurity um, landscape that we're gonna have to continue to get much better at. I think back to the Target incident, probably 2013, 2014, and their big issue was they, they actually were alerted, but it got buried in a sea of alerts, uh, this uh, third party that com uh, compromised their, uh, their network uh, through an HDAC vendor somewhere in uh, Pennsylvania, I think. But this is the key area. It's something we'll have to continue to pay attention to. And I think the other key insight is that at the end of the day, no matter what tools you have, people are going to be your first line of defense. So teaching people um, a cybersecurity awareness and teaching them what safe links are and, and doing your cybersecurity awareness training is gonna to continue to be the, the best way for you to, to make sure that people don't contribute to the problem. And I think the other big key insight that I've learned, um, and I, I've been a cloud first sort of CIO for a long time, and now I'm partner first CIO, and I, I think about who can I bring into my ecosystem to help me manage these complex changes that we're all facing. And so cybersecurity, I say here, it's become a team sport. And by that, I mean, it's, it's not something that I'd recommend anyone go alone. There's, there's too many skill sets that are needed. You couldn't hire not enough people to kind of match the, the, the progress that cyber criminals are making in the marketplace. So it's, it's not a good idea to go it alone. And I, and I think finding partners like BitSight and others is really kind of core to your strategy. Um, and uh, I think that'll continue uh, as we march down the path. Um, that, that's a quick tour through the part one of the presentation. I could certainly pause here, uh, Mike, uh, to see if there's any questions. Um, if not, I can certainly press on and, and, and tackle the, 
the next part, which is you know, more geared at sort of what's happening in the business world around cyber and risk. Yeah, we'll open it up if anybody has any questions for, for Joe. I've got a quick question for you, Joe. You mentioned Target, um, and I know you were in Minnesota there for a time. Were you in Minnesota while that incident happened, or were you here in Charlotte? I was in Minnesota at the time, um, and I, I have a, a good friend um, who actually wrote a book called Secure Enough. Uh, he, was, he calls it, I was in the room when it happened, and so he wrote about that experience. Uh, and it's a good book. He talks about 20 different controls that um, are, are relevant uh, that companies ought to be thinking about. Uh, and uh, uh, our, all of the cybersecurity team members and even the CIO that I knew when I was there, all of them all lost their jobs. So it was a complete, uh, uh, you know, kind of clean sweep of most of those resources. Target's a, a pretty great company. Um, they've bounced back and done pretty well. Um, but they were going through at that time, uh, Mike, they were moving from an Amazon uh, hosted environment for their uh, external uh, storefront to their own storefront. So they, they had a lot going on at the time. And uh, they also made a huge strategic swing and a miss uh, with their migration into Canada. So they, they were really under pressure at that time, as I recall. Well, how would you rate their cybersecurity posture at that time? Were they, you know, again, we we've seen some folks that have have some high, you know, high postures, right? They have a high appreciation, and they, you know, they have budgets, and sometimes they still get hit, right? Where, where were they? Where were they kind of at? Uh, did you? Well, my they had a, a pretty sizable cybersecurity team, and they did take it pretty seriously. Uh, I think the issue is um, this first key insight that I've got on the screen is. Uh, they had so many alerts set up, so they weren't mature in that sense, but they had every tool. They had FireEye, they had Palo Alto, they had all of these state-of-the-art at the time uh, platforms. Uh, didn't have some of the new stuff that we have available today, but you know they had a huge team. Uh, and in some ways, um, having a huge team um, isn't, isn't really the key answer. Um, it's, it's finding the right partners. It, it, cybersecurity has become so complicated. Uh, I think even the certifications now, there's probably over 20 or 25 different specialty certifications in getting cybersecurity uh, that, that exists today. So we have one question from, uh, from our audience. Um, the question is, how can people collaborate across different departments? Um, to your point, cyber being a team sport. Uh, and that, that's a key point that I'm going to touch on here in, in a moment in the second part. But it is important that, uh, you know, when I think about digital transformation, we in IT used to think about that as uh, an IT specific thing. Uh, and the truth is it's, it's really something that everyone in the organization needs to understand. So how, do, how does cybersecurity play into um, you know, your thinking as a business executive and cyber is a part of that. So I'll talk more about how I've seen that unfold. Um, it's not something that I think we're done with by any stretch. There's a lot, a lot of uh, room for improvement on that front. Great. Well, um, let's just continue on uh, with the presentation. So part two is, um, is really centered around the C-suite and digital transformation, as I just mentioned, and, and kind of what do I see uh, out ahead in terms of uh, new risks, uh, especially in this new digital landscape that we're facing. Um, the first thing I'll start with is just sort of a, a, a big picture view of the world. A, a gentleman by the name of Klaus Schwab, who is, a, I think he's an 80-year-old, um, founder of the World Economic Forum, which is an incredible think tank. He wrote um, a, a, a book several years back called The Fourth Industrial Revolution. And it was his observation that we've come through first, second, and third uh, industrial revolutions, and we're now facing an unprecedented amount of change uh, in, in this fourth industrial revolution. It's really around exponential change where physical, digital, and biological systems are accelerating uh, change at a pace we've never seen before. And so that's just the backdrop and that's creating challenges and pressures in and of itself on cybersecurity and risk. But that's the backdrop on that front. And I think businesses continue to face major market forces, uh, hyper-focused on customer with social media and mobile. Uh, you know, customers now have more influence over brand and expectations than they've ever had. 
cloud adoption used to be something we talk about in IT circles, but now there are viable solutions in the cloud, both for business applications as well as cyber. Um, I, I put a lot of our assets on, on cloud platforms and, and with partners driving them, uh, including uh, using Manhattan Associates, for example, as our distribution platform, all software as a service. Um, and that there are definitely consequences to that. IoT, I talked about earlier, big data, machine learning, artificial intelligence. Those are very real now, uh, not just buzzwords. Uh, and then in cyber now, it's just infiltrated every aspect of what we do in COVID. 19 has really uh, put pressure on that front. So these, these market forces have been there for some time now, five years now, but they're really starting to, to take root and really influencing how people think strategically about how their businesses operate. Uh, I think there are some consequences to these changes. Um, we are seeing jobs being eliminated through automation. There, there's no doubt about that. Um, and I think we'll continue to see that. I think you'll see some new roles uh, emerge, cybersecurity being one of them. I'm starting to see more C-suite executives ask questions and become more savvy around, around technology. And they're, they're thinking about how can IT become a, a strategic partner in the business? So, and, and how can it drive value and engagement with customers? So we're starting to see that uh, happen more. Uh, and then uh, we're starting to see uh, because of the cloud, um, some skill sets within IT are starting to shrink, and I'll, I'll give you a picture of that. Um, one uh, uh, attendee asked, cyber roles change, uh, what does the future look like? I'm going to talk about that in a minute uh, in some of these slides. Uh, but when you think about these three major impacts, um, and I talk about, um, and I get some pushback from some CIOs, but if you think about the, the old world that I came from uh, after 40 some years, in the old days, everything that I supported and managed from business applications to infrastructure all ran on, on a, in a data center on premise somewhere um, or a co-location. Um, and I had to staff for everything from top to bottom, from applications to data, to databases, to servers, to do everything on my own. And then with the advent of cloud, we started to see um, solution providers bring infrastructure as a service where you can put your own servers in, say, Microsoft, Google, or, uh, or Amazon. And all of a sudden, you don't need to necessarily have systems administrators managing that platform. Uh, at, Pla at Snap AV, I had a lot of platform as a service and software as a service. So platform as a service was, is a good example where I hired a third party to manage the uh, digital uh, commerce platform. Uh, we did all the custom development and all managed all the data, but they did everything else. All the care and feeding for the servers, making sure they were up, uh, making sure that they did disaster recovery testing, backing them up, did all that heavy lifting. Uh, and then I mentioned an example of software as a service uh, with Manhattan Associates, but you could certainly look at Microsoft as a simple example, uh, as well as, um, uh, you know, um, uh, you know, Salesforce.com and, and many other platforms that are available out there at Software as a Service. So you can see uh, what I'm trying to show here is that this has definitely had an impact on IT. Um, board level communication is another question I'm getting here. What does the board care about? Which is the most effective way? I've got an example of that. I'm still like a broken record, but I, I anticipated that question. And I think it's a really good question. And I've got some statistics around what's happening in, in boards and at companies around risk and cyber. Uh, pretty fascinating, actually. I wanted to just touch on one other philosophy that I, that I see evolving. It used to be when I was uh, earlier in my career that we used this design build, design build run model in IT. And I think it's changed um, and it's much more relationship based today. And, and now I would say the next gen IT organization needs to be more collaborative. Um, we need to think more about integration since there's all these cloud solutions. And now our, our responsibilities around orchestrating all of that become critically important. So on the Collaborate side, of course, it's understanding customers and, 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 and bringing in strategic partners that all drive business value. And since the cloud's real and we're able to leverage those platforms now, it's how do we integrate them to make them feel seamless? How do you pull data out of them? How do you manage you know, proprietary software development when you're in the cloud? Those are all skill sets that we're having to grow inside IT in this next gen world. 
And then on the orchestrate side, you still have to deliver value. So that's optimizing business value. That's what I mean by that. And we're still responsible for ensuring performance. Even though we're outsourcing solutions, you still aren't off the hook as an IT professional. It just puts a lot of pressure on IT to make sure that their partners are the right ones and that they're performing. And of course, protecting assets. We've been talking about uh, cybersecurity and risk a bunch. I'm gonna I'll shift gears now and, and talk about uh, a major challenge that I think is, is facing uh, the global community that we live in, and that's this crisis of trust. We don't trust companies these days. We don't trust the media, politicians, even police now seem to be under fire. Um, and, and those are opportunities for cybersecurity, cyber criminals to kind of pounce on companies. And I, I am starting to hear boards talk about this and ask questions about it. Um, I had an opportunity uh, at one of the firms that I'm talking to or working with, uh, I actually was asked by their CEO uh, to spend time with him every couple of weeks and we're talking about this as a topic and, and talking about the role of the C-suite and how to help organizations deal with the, the challenges that are in front of us. But I wanted to mention this, while I, while I, I, I may sound a little doom and gloom here, um, there are some positive things out there in, in the marketplace that I think are worth talking about. I uh, mentioned uh, Charles, or excuse me, Charles Schwab, that's a different Schwab. Klaus Schwab uh, from the World Economic Forum uh, this guy is so so fascinating and, and innovative. Um, he, he's really got his finger on the pulse of what's happening around the globe. And with this fourth industrial revolution movement, he really is making a point about um, this is a really around people. Um, it, technology isn't for technology's sake. Um, it's, it's for people and to make lives better. Um, and that's the thrust. They just had their uh, World Economic Forum meeting in Davos, Switzerland um, uh, several months back before the pandemic and they rewrote the definition of the purpose of a business and was really around people, uh, people centered and, and think, thinking of them as uh, stakeholders in your business. And that includes the communities you serve. Uh, there's a group called the Business Roundtable that's chaired by Jamie Dimon, who's the CEO of Chase, uh, JP Morgan Chase. And he's basically making a point that major employers are investing in their workers and communities because they know that's the only way they're going to survive long term and last year they rewrote the uh the purpose of a business and and surprisingly making money wasn't the first on their list it was about communities and people and stakeholders similar to the world economic forum uh, and then i'm a big fan of john mackey who who is the ceo at whole foods who started an incredible movement or at least raised our consciousness about uh, people, purpose, and planet with uh, his book uh, several years ago called Conscious Capitalism. Uh, he, here's his quote. He says, conscious businesses satisfy the needs of major stakeholders without, with profit as a consequence, not the primary obsession of the business. And he just came out with a book, a second book last week. It just uh, hit the market called Conscious Leadership, which I'm halfway through. Definitely worth the read. Uh, and then I mentioned I'm board chair of the Business Relationship Management Institute, and we're capitalizing on this movement, and we're talking about trusted relationships shaping uh, and providing a field to drive purpose in companies. So at the end of the day, um, it's about people, it's about relationships, both inside the company, outside the company, in your communities, as well as with your stakeholders. So it's a, it's a really kind of an interesting and refreshed look at the marketplace. I'm hopeful that it it, it, it's sustainable and lasts a, a long time. Uh, if we had more time today, I'd talk more about my philosophies and thoughts around this, but I, I think it's an important influence. Um, so let's talk about risk and how companies are sort of dealing with it. Um, I, I found a really interesting report from the American Institute of CPAs, uh, which is based in Raleigh, North Carolina, and that's the, the, the think tank for the, uh, the CPA community, the Certified Public Accountant community and I just did a report here several months ago and what they what they found is that executives are saying that 58 percent of the time they're saying that uh, they're getting a lot more pressure to focus on delivering information around risk and business uh, that's especially too that was pre-covid I think that number is considerably higher now um, even before COVID, boards were asking for more oversight 66 percent were asking we need to we need to hear more about it those trends I talked about at the very beginning of today's talk really are really the reason for that. I think a lot of boards are curious to know what's happening. And I found that 
um, I, I would find board members uh, who were curious about risk and I'd find time to have one-on-ones with them to talk about what their interests are. Many of them, by the way, are very fearful to admit that they have a lack of knowledge or if they do have a lack of knowledge, they, 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 they're, they're not willing to ask necessarily uh, for help. Uh, so I try to make it safe for those folks to really ask questions and learn. Um, and then uh, here's the number that, despite all that we just talked about, only 30% of companies are, are spending time on um, enterprise risk management programs. So not, that hasn't changed since uh, 2014. That number stays roughly where it is. And then very quickly, um, not many organizations see risk as uh, adding strategic value. Um, most boards delegate an oversight to risk. So in one sense, they're interested in it. On the other hand, they have kind of a hands-off view of it. And there are very few companies who put risk in their compensation plan. So it's, we still have a long way to go inside organizations. Um, and someone asked a question about um, how I communicated with board, what are they interested in seeing? And, and I actually used a bit site. Uh, our private equity firm uh, introduced us to bit site when I was at Snap AV many years ago. And I love the platform because it's very digestible. Uh, and I used the, the BitSite reporting engine to, to show progress. I, I showed them our overall score. And the way BitSite works is it, it, it looks at a ton of different aspects of your business, all external IP based. And it, and it can give you a score. It tells you how you rank uh, you know, compared to other companies. And you can actually compare yourself to, from one company to another. We've actually benchmarked. So this was a really interesting way for me to convey to them kind of the health of our business, uh, especially over time, if it fluctuates up or down. It also gave us insight, and you can see an example of uh, uh, a scorecard that was comparing firms from one to another. The first column was the firm that I was working for and the rest were uh, competitors. Um, so it kind of gave you a, a sense for how, how you know, we were, we were performing and then what areas were we weak in and, and what were we doing about those? Um, and then, you know, trends over time. So this, this was really useful in providing the, the C-suite and the board with quantifiable, externally measured information that they could rely on. And it wasn't something homegrown inside the organization it was done by a third party. And that, that really um, was a big um, plus in terms of how they viewed our, our, our profile and how they viewed our enterprise risk uh, capabilities. Um, and one of the things that I've seen done, and this is how roles are changing. In many organizations, um, you know, there's, there's, we talk about shadow IT and we talk about IT showing up. Cloud has given rise to the opportunity for business units to go, you know, use their credit card and buy a, a cloud-based platform. Um, and so one of the models that I've been propon uh, proponent of is where you've got a partner in, in the enterprise risk management plant. So typically that's a chief risk officer, uh, or in some cases now chief privacy officer, but you work with them on creating um, kind of a risk tolerance and you build macro level company risks, uh, risk policies and guardrails. And you, you communicate and share those across the organization that works in combination with the cybersecurity team or we're building cyber policies, a body of knowledge, tools, methods. We're doing the, the uh, cyber awareness, all of that. Those two things need to work in concert. And then what you have to do is get business units to take seriously all of this. And, and so where I've seen it work really well is where you've got the top leadership organizations that are really saying this is not an option. You've really got to drive home this notion that we are going to be an enterprise risk-based company and we're going to have cyber programs that you're going to have to care about. And they start to measure um, business unit uh, compatibility and compliance with uh, both enterprise risk and cybersecurity. So this, this model of it all working together and teamwork is crucial. Um, and it can't happen with, with uh, one silo within the organization trying to manage it. So th this is an oversimplified model, but it's a model that I've actually leveraged and helped companies see that everyone plays a role. Um, and if you're wondering what enterprise risk management programs can look like, I do have some sample charters. If anyone's interested, let, let Mike know and I can make the charter itself available. But it starts with identifying an owner. Um, it's got to be the chief risk officer or chief uh, privacy officer or chief compliance officer in the company. 
And then you, you've got to have skin in the game. So you've got to get the rest of the organization uh, to adopt this principle. You've got to meet regularly and, and talk about uh, risk. Um, and this is part of digital transformation. This is part of the education that we have to do is to explain why this stuff's important. Um, the, I think uh, uh, one drip and then another. Uh, GDPR um, certainly hit the, the marketplace in 2018 with a thud. Uh, people are scrambling, especially if you have international business, to try to comply. Uh, California uh, Consumer Privacy Act uh, became active in January. My whole point here is we're going to start to see other states like Nevada, Washington, Texas, New York have all announced their own programs. So I, I see this entire map turning yellow. I think uh, we'll start to see privacy um, and uh, the implications for it become much more prevalent across the across the United States for sure. I talked about the uh, cybersecurity matur uh, maturity model certification program from the DOD. Uh, I, I just want to give you a, a, a real quick overview of what that is. It started um, in um, 2019 with an idea that they needed to get better uh, in terms of filling the, the known gaps in the, the National Institute of Standards, uh, the NIST framework as it's referred to. Um, and this, this program launched in January. It's not fully implemented yet. But what's interesting about it is it features uh, third-party assessments. So if you're gonna do work for the Department of Defense, you have to have a third party come in and evaluate whether or not you comply with the CMMC standards. They're also trying to make it cost effective. Doesn't mean you have to be, you know, the top of a heap when it comes to meeting these goals. There's five levels of maturity, um, but they're trying to make it effective for small providers to, to play in the space. They, they looked at models from all over the world and tried to identify where the key gaps were, and that's how they built the model. Um, here's the quick timeline. I won't bore you with all the gory details. Um, the key is it's, it's launched. They've got third-party assessors now that are being trained. Uh, RFPs are supposed to be released this month. I don't know if they have, I haven't had a chance to follow up. And then they want full implementation by 2026. Um, and the, the reason I bring this up is that I, while it, yes, it's a Department of Defense standard, I see the private sector adopting it in droves. And, and partly because subcontractors are gonna have to comply and those are private companies oftentimes, but the framework is much more complete than the NIST framework. Um, instead of 14 domains, there's 17, so three more domains, and then they've got this maturity model. Um, if you're going to be a level three CMMC, there's 110 controls in NIST. There are 20 new controls that come along for the ride. If you're going to be a level three CMMC certified provider, those 20 controls are critical. And these, these are some of the gaps that they filled. I won't go through these in detail, uh, but uh, we'll make this PowerPoint available to you. Uh, should you want to review it. But the 20 controls are interesting in that um, you, you, you're, you'd be surprised that NIST didn't cover some of these things like um, spam protection, um, uh, impersonation protection, number nine, implement email forgery protections, sandboxing, uh, you know, performance uh, or, or comprehensive uh, resiliency testing. Um, so it's surprising that the, the, the uh, NIST framework didn't really have, cover these. There aren't many of these that I wouldn't want to have in my environment. So that's why I think many organizations are going to adopt the CMMC standard, especially adopt uh, at least these 10 controls uh, as part of their cybersecurity uh, framework. So we're right at the top of the hour. Um, I thought I'd open it up for some discussion. Um, I, I threw six of them out there. These certainly um, aren't the only six. We can talk about whatever you'd like, but uh, I hope you got some valuable information out of today's presentation. I really appreciate Bitside and Mike asking me to come and speak to you today. It was a lot of fun and uh, look forward to further collaboration with all of you. Thank you, Joe. Appreciate that. I think that on that last slide, specifically, you know, testing the backups, just being an infrastructure for over the number of years, right? Um, it can it can be tough to test that out. To um, again, just all, all the things that have to have to go into testing backups. Um, you just don't know. You don't know, right? And um, yeah, it's uh, but um, certainly it's necessary, right? And <laughs> I think you said there's what like uh, what you said seventeen, so. If you need to tackle one one a month, um, I mean, it's tough for some of these contractors 
in that DOD space, but I definitely could see it trickling down. What do you, you, you showed that map, right? That has a couple of the states that are in yellow um, being, you know, I, I've got some clients who are in healthcare, right? And, you know, all the HIPAA laws and you know, we got clients that, uh, you know, PCI compliance, um, but, you know, it, they have all these compliances, but then again, are they gonna, are they, you know, are they finding people, you know, in California, I guess, if, if they're the, if they're the poster child, yeah, I've got to comply, but what's, what's the risk there? So what are you seeing with these states? How are they, how are they kind of forcing people to be compliant? You know, I think um, I've asked uh, that question of legal experts and their, their, their response is it's going to be enforced in the courts. So I think people are uh, beginning to pay attention to the, you know, the cybersecurity parameters, the risk parameters uh, for CCPA um, in all the various states. They're all, they're all you know, uh, looking at each other and I think uh, uh, comparing notes. Um, and, and I think uh, a lot of the answer to your question will play out in, in the courts the same, same way that GDPR is. But, you know, I think at the end of the day, there's no national standard when it comes to these things. And maybe that's the direction we need to be going. Um, I, I think, uh, you know, to me, it feels like the NIST uh, framework needed a little sprucing up. And I think CMMC, as it evolves, will maybe become a platform that we could point to. And if you make yourself compliant with at least a level three standard, there's a good chance you're going to meet most of the CCPA California requirements um, and, and the other states as they come online. That's the hard part is, um, yeah, I've seen some super complicated matrices uh, in one company that I work for uh, as a consultant and they've laid out their policies and they've identified, not only do they have CMMC and NIST to worry about, but they've got a whole bunch of other uh, government frameworks that they've got to pay attention to, including HIPAA. And they've identified which of their policies match up with which of the frameworks it, it's getting so complicated um, and confusing for companies to respond to. And, and hopefully, um, you know, maybe CMMC becomes a target rich platform that we can all sort of aspire to that sort of covers the gamut of, of the things we need to care about. Yeah, I think the spreadsheet warrior days, unfortunately, are kind of, it's too complex. Um, you know, talking with the, uh, you know, our CISA roundtable, all the different protocols in every different state when you have physical facilities, right? I mean, changing by the day, kind of incorporate that with privacy and data, right? If every state has their own law, um, there's no way you're going to be able to do it on a spreadsheet, right? You got to have some sort of automation, you know, subscribe to some sort of tool, um, you know, some sort of platform that's going to keep you compliant. Um, yeah. Because, you know, again, that employee leaves, <laughs> what happens to that spreadsheet? The knowledge is, is kind of out the door because uh, what we were also seeing too, and you know, you were seeing it, Joe, but uh, pre-COVID, I mean, folks were in seats in cyber for, you know, a year, year and a half too, and then boom, you know, they were, they were leaving because um, it was you know, pretty competitive and, and uh, you, you know, where, where are you seeing that, those roles going, going forward, right? I mean, you talked about automation, there's got to be, gotta be a balance between tools and and staff, yeah. where, where, where is that going? Well, I think vendor management, vendor partnership, skill sets are coming into, um, into view of, in the cyberspace. Uh, you know, I, I'm working with a client that is um, outsourcing their SOC. And that doesn't mean that they don't have cybersecurity resources on, on, on point. You still own the policies. You still own cyber awareness. You still own incident response. Um, you might leverage those partners um, uh, in that process. Uh, but it, it's changing the way you look at those sorts of things and putting more pressure on identifying roles and responsibilities. So, uh, you know, I hate to say it, but racy diagrams seem to be a popular topic again among cybersecurity teams that are, um, you know, outsourcing these key components as a defensive posture. Um, when, as soon as someone gets attacked and you identify a, a vulnerability in your arsenal, that what happens invariably is you get questions from, and appropriately, you get questions from the C-suite of the board, and like, how'd this happen? How can you prevent it from happening again? And, and, and then you start thinking, well, I, I can hire people to do this, or I can go find a partner to help. And that's usually uh, the recommendation that I push people towards, which means you've really got to think about how, you, how do you partner, what roles do they have, and how do, you, how do you play that role every day operationally in your organization? And the other thing, too, like if you could touch upon is, you know, uh, in, in your career, there's downturns, right? Uh, you never know where they are, but you know, these economic changes happen. 
Um, cyber, from my perspective, and just from, from talking to the folks and just being there, right, when, when uh, clients are looking at projects and sometimes budget hasn't been approved, maybe there's some frustrations on their side of saying, hey, I know we're at risk. <laughs> However, you know, the, the folks that are, are signing the checks don't see it that way. So, you know, you know, we know if you go on the highway, <laughs> you got to have a seatbelt. It's, it's really good to have an airbag, but uh, some people don't want the airbag until they've been in an accident. So, how, you know, during these ec economic times, right, uh, budgets are tight. There's a lot of unknowns. Like, how, what are those conversations? What do you see? How do you have those conversations, right? We know you need them, but um, are you, are you, are you? Sunsetting other tools, um, you know. Obviously, our, our friends here at BitSite, you've used them. What What do you see? How do you? And the budget thing is always a tough, tough thing at the end of the day, right? Well, I think it's it's a communication. And one of the questions uh, from our our uh, our attendees is, how do you? What's What's the one thing we can do tomorrow to to make tomorrow safer for our organizations? And and it, it's it's uh, uh, the word that comes to mind is communicate. Uh, and a second word would be share. Um, and I, I, I think uh, from my from my point of view, what I've been trying to do is communicate and share the realities of the world that we live in with the C-suite and make them understand that it is not okay to say that they don't understand cyber or technology. That's not an okay thing to say in today's world. Uh, I think COVID-19 has helped that along considerably, but I still think there's room for improvement. My biggest worry is that once we're through this this pandemic and things return to whatever the new normal is that people sort of relax about risk and cyber. Um, and, you know, I saw that happen uh, in 2001 when we were sort of through the September 11th event. New York was a friendly place for about six months and then it kind of went back to normal. We sprung back to the normal. And I'm, I'm worried that um, if we're not careful that we we may relax a little bit. I'm hoping I'm wrong about that, but I think, to me, Mike, it's it's communication and sharing, and and not being afraid to talk about real issues. Uh, and it is the C-suite's responsibility. I think I wouldn't be surprised to see legislation change over time, where organizations are held to task if they don't have the right controls in place. In fact, the SEC reprimanded um, a a major bank. Uh, two weeks ago, uh, forcing the CEO to resign because they were warned and warned and warned about their cybersecurity programs and they got frustrated and at the end of the day, they find them and it forced the CEO to resign. Uh, so I, that sort of thing, I think will begin to happen more, more often. And when it does, then executives and boards are gonna start taking it a lot more seriously than they do. Yeah, I mean, again, the CMC, again, it's not, super publicized out there for strategic reasons, right? The DOD, but from, you know, my sources, the folks that are experts, right? Just seeing that the military has now five domains, they added, you know, they added space, but before they added space this year, they added cyber. So if the military is adding cyber, right? If you look at where all the money is going to, these are, where's the people, where's, where how's this being funded? It's not just the bad guys, it's the, it's the nation states, right? The nation states have, all, it's their military, it's their, how they're, you know, getting an advantage out there. This is this is real big money. This is billions of dollars of, of folks who, uh, you know, ha have the keys to the castle, right? That are funding <laughs> everything that goes downstream, right? I mean, yeah, it's a good point, Mike, and that actually brings up one one other point. Um, I've actually seen the I won't name which part of the federal government this is, but they're actually using BitSite to evaluate third party relationships that they're engaged with. So they're, they're looking at how's this company that I want to do business with performing? And you can use BitSite to sort of evaluate that. It's all public IP. It's, all, it's not, they're not, you know, reaching into your firewalls and stealing proprietary information, but they're looking at your performance as a third party and fourth party provider. And they're, they're trying to understand who they're doing business with. And I, I see that happening more and more and more. And that's a, an innovative way to use the, the BitSite platform. Um, that that I hadn't even thought of until I got to this organization and the, the one of these divisions I was on a call with a CISO from one of these divisions and they were asking very specific questions about this company's stance on a particular issue and I'm, I was wondering how in, in God's name did they figure out we know, we had a known issue how did they know about it because we didn't publicize it and it hadn't reached the the level of an event 
uh, but they were certainly aware of it and it turned out that they were using bedside <laughs> and could see what we could see. Yeah, it's, but uh, you know, as I've gotten, you know, more into the cyber with the, the cyber buyer, right? Just the things that, you know, our friends do at BitSight, it's, uh, you know, the people that are using it, it's pretty intelligent, right? The, the third party risk. And then we ran into uh, a company that has franchises, right? And they're like, how do we keep an eye on our franchisees? Because we can't really tell them, you know, again, like patching and there's a whole bunch of other different stuff there, but, you know, they can say something and they could maybe prove it on paper, but how do I really kind of have that, which I thought was really clever on how, you know, they were looking to use BitSight into making sure that their franchisees are doing what they say they do to make sure, because if that brand gets, uh, you know, infiltrated internationally, it's going to come downstream. And guess what? At the end of the day, it comes to the, the CEO, right? And the C-suite. Yeah. So, um, you know, it, it's also a great tool for shadow IT. Uh, so if you've got business units standing up sites and doing things out on the public, um, you without them even, you, without you asking for permission, you can point BitSight at that engine and take a look at the, the risk profile of that platform. And it's, it's a way that you can do that without, you know, being intrusive. Uh, it, it's just, um, I think tools like BitSight, um, I'm sure they've got competitors, uh, but um, no one that I've seen that, that holds a candle to the platform, but I see it as a tool that'll, that'll find new uses um, in organizations over time. Uh, it's again, it goes back to that, you know, finding the right partner and, and you can't do the heavy lifting on your own. You gotta, you gotta find trusted uh, partners that can help you row that boat. With that, uh, any other last questions before we uh, wrap up today's webinar? Well, before that, Joe, how do people get a hold of you? If folks want to get a hold of you, I know, uh, I think you said you might be penning a new book. Uh, I don't want to put yeah. you on the spot in regards to due dates, but uh, <laughs> what's what, what what's coming up for you here at the end of this year, uh, beginning of next year? Still writing. Hopefully the book will be out sometime mid next year. Um, right now, I don't have an official title, but I've been calling it Demystifying IT. Um, I'm talking about some of what we talked about here today and, and more. Uh, and then you can find me on LinkedIn or Joe at CIOMentor.com. Excellent. And uh, for our friends who, who are on, uh, we'll be uh, contacting you, you shortly about uh, your, your gift from Uber Eats. So thank you, everybody, for, for attending today. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, let us know. We get you in touch with, with Joe. And again, thank you, Joe, and uh, the BitSight team so much for uh, your participation and supporting CyberBuyer. So with that, I wish you guys all safe, health, and happiness. Take care. Thank you.